Hello everyone, how are you doing? Welcome new subscribers. Thank you subscriber for following us, liking and sharing our videos. We appreciate all of you. My name is Reverend Penelope Stewart. You can follow Chemistry on Facebook, Instagram, and Twitter. Today I'm here with you again with another book review. I've been wanting to get this book for a while. And I finally got it and read it over the weekend. It's a very short book, Who Do Bible Magic by Miss McKaylee and Professor Charles Porterfield. Here you go. I think I got this book. I don't even know where I got this book. I think I got it from Amazon. I think I did. I think I got this book from Amazon. It was like nine bucks. Not very much money at all very good book uh what i liked about this book is that it showed you the esoteric magic that was in the bible and then it lists all the scriptures especially psalms psalms is full of magic it's full of esoteric meaning that will help you with your magic your spell work your condition work whatever you want to call it is good for that and it goes into detail about some of those uh scriptures that's in your bible but i have some things marked in here that i wanted to go over with you that i thought that was very interesting so let's begin let me see where's my first markings at oh here's my first first markings you know and, and before i begin I wanted to discuss something. I've been seeing a lot of people that don't look like me, uh, our white brothers and sisters, that's deeply into hoodoo, that's deeply into conjure. And I see nothing wrong with that. I see nothing wrong with that. But what I'm running into is a lot of defensive, toxic attitudes about hoodoo. It's important for you to understand that this is an African-American magic. It was originated by African-American slaves, African slave, indigenous slaves. It's important for you to understand that. And there is no initiation required. There is no particular way to work hoodoo. All right? Because what I'm going into, you know, just because you got initiated... You fell for the hype. You know, I don't think a spirituality costs us any money. And the, for those that, you know, get initiated, that is your preference. But for me, I don't believe that initiation is necessary. You can spend all that money and still not effectively know how to work this. Okay, so it's important for you to understand that. Because I've been, I've been running into a lot of resistance with... My white brothers and sisters, when it comes to hoodoo, they think just because you're not initiated, you know, that you don't have any adequacy or any, you know, power in working this. But let me tell you some African-American brothers and sisters and white people as well. This came from my ancestors. I'm empowered by this already. I don't need any initiation. This is not about initiation, but experience. Okay, so I don't need any initiation. And it doesn't make you better than me because you are initiated. You just work in a system. You got some rules that you follow. I don't have any rules that I follow. Who do is not about really any rules that you follow. You chose to get initiated into an ATR and follow some rules. You know, so to me, it's just like jumping back into the pan of religion again organized religion so please don't come at me with your, your initiations i'm glad you got it if that makes you feel more adequate then so be it but don't come telling me that i need to be initiated or i need to work my hoodoo a certain kind of way for it to be effective you know, I have, I'm following my ancestors and that's what hoodoo is all about. If my ancestor leads me to work with Lord Ganesh, I'm going to work with Lord Ganesh. If my ancestors lead me to work with Papa Legba, I'm going to work with Papa Legba. 
If I'm led to work with Oshun, I'm going to work with Oshun. If I'm led, you know, it doesn't matter. As long as I'm following what my ancestors have put on me, that's all that matter. Because that's where all the power is really going to come from anyway, is from the ancestors. It's going to come from there. All those African ancestors, all those slaves that came over here and created this. That's all the initiation I need. That we need. That you need. All right? So I wanted to get that, you know, because I, I've been having some issues uh, with some of... And I have nothing, I have nothing against that, but I've been having some issues with white people that are in ATRs and they're practicing conjure hoodoo and they want to tell you yours is not good or you're, you're, you know, bringing that fear stuff, telling you, you don't practice a certain kind of way. So you can't be affected, you know, because they're initiated and all this and all that. And what I found following spirit, the more you think you know, the more you don't know. So just because you got that initiation and you follow system, are you following spirit? Are you following the spirit? That's the main thing. Are you following your ancestors? You following a system. All right. So I wanted to be very clear about about that because I've been having some issues with that. You know, it just blows my mind how people can let this really, you know, just because you got initiation doesn't mean you're better than anyone else. And, you know, to me, it's, it's a, it's a pimp game to me. The initiation thing is just a pimp game. That's all it is. That's how I look at it. I heard another sister say the same thing. You pay some money. You know, it doesn't make you more efficient or effective than me. You know, I'm following the spirit. I'm following my ancestors. I'm following my intuition. All right. So I'm done with that. I'm I'm done with my rant. But I just had to get that out there because I've been running into some issues with that lately. Um, uh, this book is about 96 pages. Yes, yeah, 96 pages. Uh, let's see how many chapters is in here. Like it's, it's a very short book. It's an easy read too. And it just gives you a brief description of the esoteric meanings in the Bible and some of the magic formulas you can work and where some of these magic formulas come from. I was very surprised by some of uh, the things, some of the things uh, who do practice and where they come from. So I was very surprised. Uh, let me see. I'm looking at one, two, three, four, five, four, maybe four chapters in this book. I'm not going to go through all the naming all the chapters in here or sections. I'll let you do that on your own. But I'm going to read a few sections in this book that I have marked. And they're very interesting. I try to mark the interesting ones. Okay, let's dive in. This one is called In the Beginning, The Bible Comes to Hoodoo. A word of 50 fitly spoken is like apples of gold in pictures of silver. Proverbs 25 and 11. The Bible in Christianity entered, entered African dysphoria during the difficult times but became and enmeshed with the folk beliefs of conjure practice that the two are now inseparable. Just as our knowledge of scriptures does not come from one source, so too our knowledge of root work is not limited to a single voice, book, or place. You heard that. So it's not limited. Who do is not limited? You don't have to be in this little box with it. That's what I love about hoodoo because it has a, such a wide spectrum in it. It comes instead from people who daily lived with their beliefs and practices of prayer and magic. Much of this history has been preserved by folklorists, community record keepers, archive, archivists, manufacturers of spiritual supplies, these individuals help bring the knowledge across time to us. Thanks to them, in some cases, we know not only where long past practitioners live, 
but also their names and professions because they name a lot of profession of root workers in this book and they kind of give you a brief brief um description of their lives they give you a summary of their lives so but i'm not going to go through that i'll let you buy the book and you look at that all right they live they live on in their words books such as ours would scarcely be possible without the work of our forerunners a handful of them stand out to us particularly for what they have preserved of the religious aspects of hoodoo and then they go on to name some of the works and books many have contributed to hoodoo this continues on to today and such sources as e e Yvonne Shiro 2003 black magic religion and the african-american country tradition and Jeffrey E Anderson 2007 conjure in african-american society we are addicted to them all. I haven't read any of those books. I think I, it seemed like I read the one, uh, Black Magic Religion in African American Conjuring. It's just a lot of people. If I'm if if I'm not mistaken, it's just a lot of short stories in that book about people working with hoodoo. You know. It was okay to me, but I was looking for more information. That's why I bought the book. I'm looking for more how to and sharing information of that but it, it talks more about the conjuring people and their experience in hoodoo that's basically what that book is about if i'm not mistaken is magic incompatible with the bible in the beginning god created the heaven and the earth genesis 1 and 1. this is page 6 in this book as we see the biblical quotation above, the Holy Scriptures themselves begin with the greatest of all mag magical acts, the creation of existence by God. The Scriptures contain countless examples of magic, miracles, wonders, dreams, visions, prophecies, and they have been used throughout the ages as guide, instruction, ma instruction manuals, formulary, formulary, comfort giver, enemy thwarter and constant companion however at various times and places the use of holy scriptures and magic has come under fire by ecclesiastic authorities the conventional view of magic in some modern churches is one of the unremitting and invariable condemnations for this reason many assume that magic of all kinds is forbidden by god some people have even told us that they are drawn to magic in part because their experience with Christianity had been painful or emotionally damaging and that to practice magic was a personal declaration of independence or a vital part of their healing and personal growth. That is my part in it because it's helped me do a lot of healing and for my personal growth. I've not had a very good experience with Christianity, so to speak. And so that's why I think that is why I I chose to go outside the box of religion and discover a more personal relationship with my higher power, with the divinity. All right. To all our readers who love magic, but were taught that there is no such thing as as biblical Jewish and Christian spell casting, we bring you the good news the bible does in fact contain accounts of magic the bible has been used by devout jews and christians to perform magic you heard it there and the books of the bible the actual written scrolls printed pages are themselves magical some may disagree with this and with that and with what we teach herein in the end, this book is simply what we have been taught and guided to, not an ultimate authority. The ultimate authority is God alone. Some may even try and turn you away from the secrets that we offer you here. They may seek to deny you the blessings and powers that are rightfully yours from God. But remember, the devil can cite scripture for his purpose. So in words of Isaiah 52, one verse one 
we say to each of you, reading this, awake, awake. Put on thy strength, O Zion. Put on thy beautiful garments, O Jerusalem. Come and light your glowing candles. Burn your fragrant incense and open your household altars to the beauty and the power of the magic in the Bible. So you heard it here. All right. Heroes of the Bible work magical spells. In the Bible, that's on page seven in this book. In the Bible, there are many instances of magic and spell work, but they have been blurred by religious dogmatism and obscured by the misses of history and no longer seem to be, be the kinds of acts that most people mean when they say magic spells. Please allow us to remind you of them here. And so they go on to name some of the magical people in the Bible, starting with Moses, Joseph, Aaron, Joshua. You know, they just go on to name them. I had something else marked here. This is my oh, this one. This is I'm trying not to make this long, but I thought that I would share these markers with you because it's you know so you'll get a little bit more of an idea about how the book flows. Sketches of Christian root workers, page 15. This is Doctor Conjurer's faithful disciple disciples. Is any sick among you? Let him call for the elders of the church and let them pray over him, anointing him with oil in the name of the Lord, James 5, 14. The bond between the root doctor and the church is deep and abiding. In his five-volume Hoodoo Conjuration Witchcraft published in 1970 through 1978, the Reverend Harry M. Hyatt related stories of his 1930s tour of the South, where he interviewed root working ministers and preachers. He was given dozens of spells that called for the recitation of the scripture, were performed in the names of the Trinity or the Apostles, or made physical use of the Bible, holy oil, or holy water. As one professional conjure doctor told him, you know, the Lord Jesus Christ is the biggest hoodoo man in the world. You got to have him to go along with you to do these things. That's what my, I cringe at because they talk about the blood of Jesus in here. That's my only drawback with that. And I'm still trying to, because I have integrated out of the Jesus thing. And so with who do they, they, they do work with Jesus in here. So, you know, I don't know. I'm really, I'm really torn in, in between that. So I'm really trying to work on that. You know, do I got to believe it to use it? Because, you know, to find out that that he was not a actual person and then to use this, I just, I don't know. I've just got mixed feelings about that. Jim Haskins, in his 1978 book, Voodoo and Hoodoo, The Craft as Revealed by Traditional Practitioners, noted that the Baptist church was particularly attractive to the slaves for certain aspects of it practice were identifiable with African religious traditions. I didn't know that. And Jeffrey E. Anderson cited the same linkages in his 2001 book, Conjure in African American Society. Some Hoodoo doctors were especially gifted with the ability to conjure by God or spirits, as had been their African forebears. The same is true today. So some of them, you know, they look at some looked at the back Baptist uh, religion and saw that it it mimicked a lot of African tradition religions. So they, they you know they were attracted to it. This more of the slaves were attracted to it. Maybe because of the charisma, all the charisma that's in there. Maybe that was it. You know, and then they go on. To name certain root doctors in the book. Some root doctors I have never heard of before. The next one we're going to read is page 18, Spiritual Church Mediums. Historically, African American spiritualist churches traced their lineage back to the 19th century. American spiritualism. 
1922, National Spiritualist Association churches enforced a policy of racial segregation and expelled in mass from the NSAC. The Black Spiritualists then formed the Color Spiritual Association of Churches. Over the years, the CSAC skim, skimism became defunct, leaving in its place a loose confederation of denomination as well as many independent and non-denominational churches collectively known as spiritual church movement. Within these denominations, there are several forms of Judeo-Christian liturgical style, including elements of Catholicism, Protestantism, and a mixture of both. Many include recognizable elements of African diasporic ancestral tra traditions, and some hold services in honor of specific non-Christian spirits and spirit guides, such as so uh, Leader Black Hawk, a Native American warrior of the late 18th and, and early 19th centuries. These churches may hold mediumship training courses and their program may include instructions in psychic reading, scrying, and crystal ball gazing. Their pastors may lead members in prayers, contact with ancestor spirits, candle work at the altar, and even casting spells of beneficial magic that are identical to those found within hoodoo folk magic. So you had these spiritually spiritual churches full of black people that come from slavery and they're carrying a lot of their traditions and folk magic with them. And so they have these churches and they're teaching people this stuff. I think that is so amazing because I don't know of any churches that's doing that now. I think the only one that has probably a church like that and it's not really a physical church is, uh, what's her name? Ironwood. I forgot her name, but I did a book report. I did a book review on one of her books. But uh, Kat, I forgot her name. Gosh, I can't even remember it. But I did a book review. I think I did uh, one of her books is Paper in My Shoe. And then uh, the Hoodoo Magic book. But she has a spiritualist church, but I don't think it's a physical church per se. All right, and then let me move on. Forget not all his benefits. The Bible itself is a magical book. I'm trying to see if I have anything else in here. Oh, yeah, I have some things. This might be a long video because I have it's one more thing I want to read to you guys before I close this out. I thought that was very interesting. That was very interesting to me. The Bible itself is a magical book. Heaven and earth shall pass away, but my word shall not. Mark 13 and 31. Written magic has existed almost as long as there has been writing. We see it in Egyptian pampery, Roman cursing tablets, Hebrew prayers, inside the Muzat, Mayan Cadices, ancient tablets, reproduced in the long lost 8th, 9th, 10th books of Moses, and yes, in the Bible itself. In these days of near universal literacy, we have long forgotten how strange it is that living speech, declaration of love, threats of war, lies, rumors, confessions, curses, blessings, and stories of miracles can be reduced to mute marks on paper and then brought back to life by those who know the art of reading. Remember that during the Middle Ages, the act of reading silently to oneself was viewed with suspicion and fear, for it was seen as a magical act in and of itself. Dang, you couldn't even get caught reading to yourself. That was something. All of this is only a small part of the reason that the Bible and the other books of the scripture are, are objects of power. Joshua Tran Tranchenberg Author of Jewish Magic and Superstition explains it this way. The Bible virtue has consisted primarily in divine origin. It speaks in the voice of God. It possesses something of the personality attributes of, of the deity. And so there grow, grow up schools of mystical esoteric exegesis, which profess to discover the hidden inner significance of the word, not only is it the Lord, the word of the Lord, it is the Lord himself. 
So that's how he, he's saying it's the Lord himself that's speaking uh, in this Bible. We are taught that one does not steal or deface the Bible. When writing out a portion of scripture for use in country, do not tear out a page from your Bible. It is tempting to print out verses from the internet, but we believe you should instead hand copy your portion onto paper and finish with the name of a specific book, chapter, verse, from which it is quoted. After this, your name or command can be written as a signature at the end of the verse. Around it in a circle or square or atop it, either crisscross or running over the lines of scripture. As we see later, such, such a hand copy portion of the scripture may be used to contain personal concerns or even the burnt to obtain Bible ashes. But never do we destroy or, or obliterate a Bible. They talked a little bit about Bible ashes in there. I'm not going to get into that. But they do talk about working with Bible ashes, how to burn Bible ashes. They talk about several things. How to make prayer, par prayer papers. Brain prayer papers to make Bible ashes, see? Boiling or infusing prayer papers, bathing, washing, and laundering with prayers, ingestion of infused prayers. I mean, there is some interesting things in here. i tell you that right now. So I think I'm getting ready to end this. I'm getting ready to end this. The protective mutzuza. And thou shalt write them upon the doorposts of thy house and upon thy gates. Deuteronomy 11 and 20. Scripture text empowers the small rectangular box found on the doorpost of Jewish homes. The muzazah, talisman, although small, carry a big message. The holy words can protect and purify you. In biblical times, mezuzah simply meant the doorpost of a house. Exodus 12, 7, 22, and 23, the Mitzvah was where the blood was applied at the first Passover. Exodus 21 and 6, a servant who wanted to serve his master for life had, had his ear pierced at the Mitzvah. Eli the prophet sat at the Mitzvah of the sanctuary you know I, this is my first time ever hearing of that i don't think i've ever seen a mezuzah and like i said if you guys have heard my review on the africans who wrote the bible and about the akan people because they are the original uh, people that wrote the bible so these people were indigenous as well so parts of the bible that you're reading come from that indigenous first Jews who were dark-skinned people. So, and a lot of you didn't know that, but the information is out there. I'll talk about that in the Africans that wrote the Bible. Then I talk about it a little bit. I think, what is that? What is that book? I, I did a book review on one of those books. I can't even remember the name of the book. Mama Wata. Maybe it was a Mama Wata, Orisha Link video probably the orisha links video i talk about that maybe a little bit all right let me go on i digress i'm so sorry over time the meaning of the word musaza shifted from doorposts to the box attached to it and finally to the scroll in the box inscribed with the text of deuteronomy 6 4 through 9 on the reverse, the scroll is the name of God, Shaddai Almighty, an acronym for Shomer Dot Dot Yisrael, guardian of the guardian of the door doors of Israel. Shin, the first letter of Shaddai, Shema Shomer Dot Yisrael, may decorate the Mesuzah Mesuzah case. In the 20th century, Jews freely shared the magic of the mezuzah with African-American root doctors. That's what I thought was interesting because you have, you know, again, hoodoo is so wide range. But then in here, they said that 
Moses was taught hoodoo, you know. So it goes into great details about their their esoteric, because it's like this is their own esoteric, them their own esoteric meaning. They have their own esoteric teachings. So this is like their esoteric teachings that's in this book. This is their belief, and this is their philosophy on how they work their hoodoo. All right, even though it comprised of so many different aspects of religions or spiritual practices as well. Hoodoo is just, like I said, it's very vast, and that's what I like about it. And it's always evolving and synchronizing. But let me go on. Mezuzas were sold via ass in Chicago Defender and in the 1951 Clover Horn Hoodoo Catalog. From Baltimore, it was said that many people carried the Hebrew mezuzah as a good luck token to ward off evil, attract favorable vibrations. Each mezuzah contains sacred writings written in the parchment in a highly polished case. The folklore of mezuzah prayer wells in religious, religious significance. Jewish custom states that if you move, you should leave a mezuzah for the next occupant. occupant. So certain rental properties and homes have become desirable because the mezuzah affixed to them. Some hold that the mezuzah expels evil. Others say that a house lacking one is open to ill fortune. And today there are many who affix mezuzah charms to the doorposts of their cars. See, I never heard of that before. I don't think I've ever seen one before. And this is the last one I'm going to read and I'm going to close out. I do apologize about this video being long, but I really wanted to give a good book review and read some things in this book to let you give you a brief summary or a brief feel about how the uh, book kind of flows. This is page 29 called Scriptural Magic. Is not my word like fire, declares the Lord, and like a hammer that breaks the rock in pieces? Jeremiah 23 and 29. For centuries, people have used not just the Psalms, but the entirety of the Holy Scriptures to bring about magic. Jewish Kabbalists and others after them developed scriptural spells with verses from almost every book of the Bible. These magical uses of scriptural verses have come down to us from the followers of Jewish, Christian, and Christian spiritualists and hoodoo practice. The Kabbalists attributed deep magical importance to certain portions of the Torah, which they thought to be particularly efficacious. efficacious. They felt that anyone who reads daily Exodus 16, the chapter about manna, would be guarded against a lack of food in that daily reading of Exodus 30 verses 34 through 38, which details the composition of the temple incense would protect one against magic, evil spirits, and plagues, and that it would even delay death by warding off the angel of death. The words of the Holy Scriptures are potent charms against forces of evil in times when spirit attacks are more likely, such as before a funeral, during the hours of childbirth, or in times of sickness or trouble. Studying the Bible is believed to be preventative and against preventative aid against demonic forces. Simha, being Samuel of Vitry, a French Talmud of the 11th and 12th centuries, Put it this way, as soon as a man has ceased his preoccupation, preoccupation with the words of the Torah, Satan has a permission to attack. You know, I and since, you know, that's why I say some of my stuff contradict because I'm like, this Satan thing is really like negative energy and negative thinking because psychology is the study of the soul. All right, so you're talking about your mind, Satan coming in, attacking your mind. You know, so that's when the doubt comes in. All right, so I, I would like to speak up to see that's, that's why I have mixed feelings since I have evolved in certain areas. Some of this I have mixed feelings about. So, you know, moving on. Most useful. 
useful of all these is said to be the portion of the Bible which describes the sacrificial offerings. Regular study of these verses is believed to be effective substitute for actual sacrifices, thus to bring about wondrous rewards for in words of the 17th century. Rabbi Abraham Horace, if people knew how important these verses, this is what he says, Rabbi Abraham Horowitz. If people knew how important these verses are, they would cherish each letter as though it were a crown of gold upon their head. Generally, the verses chosen for magical use are of those kinds, verses which, which because they contain the name of God or speak of his power, and acts, and acts have come to be regarded as being possessed of his innate power. And verses which seem to have a direct relationship and bearing on the current situation to be dealt with. Like I said, this and it goes on to name all these verses in the Bible that's good to work with. Talks about psalm magic. It's packed with a little bit of information. But like I said, this is an esoteric guide to the Bible. So if you want to know more about the esoteric scriptures that's in the Bible. This is a great book for that. Very short book. It's more of a reference book. It gives you some condition work in here. If you're interested in more spell work, there's some spell work in here too for different things. But yeah, it gives you different chapters, uh, if di uh, information where you can go in the Bible and work, do different work in it. A really good reference book. So if you're doing hoodoo, you're into hoodoo, you know, you're going to probably need this book to really understand the esoteric meaning in it. But I think that's all for now. I'll be coming back probably later this week with another uh, book review. I got I have to read the book. It really doesn't take me long to read these these short books. If it's not over 100 pages, I really I read it very quickly. But I thank you so much for being here with me today. I hope this video was insightful. I hope you enjoyed it. Light and love. May the ancestors be with you.